and that your Holy Spirit would do that in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we begin the first Sunday of 2024, the year that we have designated as the year of intentionality, we're going to take some time to examine what it looks like to live intentionally. And when I say we're going to take some time to look at what it looks like to live intentionally, I'm not talking about we're going to take a few minutes this morning. We're going to designate the entire month of January, and we might even extend a little bit into February, looking at what does it look like to live intentionally. This morning, we are going to hit it in a general aspect, but in the coming weeks, we are going to focus more specifically on what does it look like to intentionally walk in holiness. What does it look like to intentionally evangelize? What does it look like to intentionally love one another? Living a life of intentionality is something that will, I think, challenge us. And also, as we see the ways in which it's making a difference, I think it will also encourage us. Last week we said that if we're going to make an intentional impact, we are going to have to do three things. Hopefully you can at least remember some of these three things. Number one, you're going to have to hold tightly to God. You're going to have to say, you know what, though none go with me, still I will follow. Regardless of what is coming at me in life, I am a follower of Jesus and I am never going to let go. We looked and we saw that we should also, if we're going to make an intentional impact, we should also have each other's backs because there are going to be times when we are going to face attacks, when we are going to be going through difficult circumstances and we're going to need somebody to say, you know what, if you're struggling over there, I'm going to come and I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help to lift you up. Oh, and, it, and if I'm struggling, you're going to come and you're going to help me to be lifted up as well. And then we said the third thing is we need to be bold. We need to be bold in our testimony and our witness for Christ. We need to be willing when he calls us to step out, to step out. When he says, hey, I want you to love your, your neighbor in ways that you haven't loved them before, then you know what? We're going to boldly step out and do that. When he says, I want you to reach out to these people you've never reached before, then we're going to boldly step out and we're going to do that. This morning, we're going to be looking at the book of 2 Peter. The book of 2 Peter, you're almost all the way to the end of your Bible. And we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter number 1. Peter writes this book to both encourage and to challenge believers. And as, I, as we look at it this morning, I think we're going to experience both of those things. 2 Peter chapter number 1, starting in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle... Of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, talking about his glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world that is caused by evil desires. For this very reason... Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me just pause there for a moment. We'll read a few more verses I doubt that any of you would say, my goal in life, and again, you can just look at verse number eight, my goal in life is to be ineffective and unproductive, right? I doubt that very many people would say, listen, I, I've written down my goals for 2024. A lot of people do that at the beginning of the year. 
And they say, my goal is this. I want to be ineffective and I want to be unproductive. I don't think that's very many people's goals. Now, maybe if you feel like you're being worked too hard, you're like, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to be unproductive for a day so they realize how valuable I am. No, I don't think any of us would say, I want to be ineffective and I want to be unproductive. And we certainly don't want to do that when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse number nine continues, and it says this, but if anyone does not have them, talking about all of the things that were just listed, look what it says, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I would imagine that most of you would like that. You would like a warm welcome into heaven, right? I certainly want a warm welcome into heaven. I want, when I walk into heaven, I I would love to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I would love that to be the welcome into heaven. We're going to back up and we're going to just teach our way through this passage. I, in studying and preparing, I was thinking I might be able to teach the entire chapter of 2 Peter, but you know me well enough by now to know that's just not going to be possible this morning. So we're going to try to do the first 11 verses. And if we only get through the first five, that's okay. If we only get through the first seven, that'll be all right. But we'll see how far we get. Go back to verse number one and you are introduced to the author and the audience. Now, the author is someone that you're reasonably familiar with if you've studied the Bible or even if you've just casually read the Bible. Most of you have probably heard of the Apostle Peter. He introduces himself as Simon Peter. He's the fisherman that was called to follow Jesus. We know that he was the bold and sometimes impulsive one. We know that he's the one who, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? He boldly said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He was the one who was part of the inner circle, if you will, of the disciples. He's also the one who tried to tell Jesus that he wasn't going to allow him to go to the cross. You remember what Jesus said to that. (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. The cross is part of God's plan. He's also the one who denied that he ever knew the Lord when he was standing there and he was questioned in the courtyard. But Jesus went to Peter after the resurrection to make sure that Peter continued in his faith and continued in his ministry. So it's not surprising, or maybe it is, but we find Peter preaching the sermon at Pentecost. And if you look toward the end of chapter number two, you'll know that as a result of Peter standing up there and boldly proclaiming the word of God, over 3,000 people were saved that day. That's the Peter that we're talking about. It's also the Peter that you continue to read about in the book of Acts. You'll find that he walks up to a crippled beggar. And he says, and I think this is one of maybe the more familiar statements Out of the Bible, he says, silver and gold have I none, but that which I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And sure enough, he gets up, the blind beggar does, and he walks. That's this Peter. It was also the same Peter who was thrown into jail for his testimony of Jesus, thrown into jail for sharing and preaching the gospel. It was Peter, though, who needed a special vision from God to realize that God was including the Gentiles in his plan of salvation. It was also Peter who was told by Jesus that he was going to die as a result of his faith, and eventually he did. That's this Peter who writes this letter. Much experience with Jesus. Much experience with the early church. Much experience with those who doubted, much experience with those who didn't believe, much experience with new Christians and seasoned Christians, much experience with those who had been persecuted, much experience with the name of Jesus. 
And I like how he introduces it himself. He says, Simon Peter, and he says this, two seemingly opposite terms, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And it's here that we get what I would consider our first point and our first challenge for this morning. Peter was from many people's perspective, the apostle. Not just a apostle, but the apostle. But he identifies himself, first of all, as what? A servant. He didn't say, here are my credentials, listen to me. He starts off this letter by saying, Simon Peter, a servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. Christ. When Jesus came, do you remember what he said? What he said about himself in Matthew 20, 28. He said, the son of man, talking about himself, did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Right before Jesus said that about himself, he said this. This is found in Matthew 20, verses 26 through 27. His disciples were arguing amongst themselves about who would be able to sit beside him in his kingdom. And Jesus says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave just as, and this is verse 28, the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve. Now, it's interesting because if you have followed along in recent years as we have been preaching and teaching our way through the Gospels, one thing has become apparent. The disciples are slow learners. Jesus had taught them from the very beginning in the Sermon on the Mount. He had taught them not only the mindset that he wanted them to have, but he taught them the heart that he wanted them to have. And yet we get toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry and we still find them bickering amongst themselves, saying, who's going to be greatest? Who's going to get to sit on his right hand? Who's going to get to sit on his left? But something really amazing happened. After Jesus went to the cross, after he was raised from the dead, after he ascended to heaven, it is almost as if the disciples realized, oh, we really, we really need to start putting into practice those things that we were taught. We really need to take seriously the mind of Christ that he wants us to have, the heart that he wants us to have. And we're very similar. If we think that we have all the time in the world to learn something, we're a bit casual with how serious we are about learning whatever that might be. You say, ah, I don't know about that. Well, let me ask you this. And I don't mean this to be hard on you, but wouldn't you say that the greatest challenge we have in life is to become like Christ? All right? Now, I don't know how long all of you have been been believers, but my guess is that many in here have been a follower of Christ for more than a month. And if you've come to know Christ in the last month, welcome to the family of God. I, I rejoice with you. The angels rejoice with you. Many of you have been a a Christian for more than a year, for more than five years. Maybe some of you more than 10 years, 20 years. Maybe some of you more than 50 years. But we're pretty casual oftentimes about how diligent we are with becoming like Christ. We have His Word and we... Maybe open it whenever we come together and maybe we don't even bother bringing a Bible with us when we come together. And and, and again, if you're using an electronic version of the Bible, uh, that's okay. I really encourage people to to have the Bible, be able to write in it, you know, open it up. I love like being able to, I'm a visual learner in a lot of ways. I, I can remember like where on the page a certain thing is. And so even if I don't know exactly where it is, I'll be like, I know it's top right right underneath a heading, and so I'll just kind of flip, okay, it's right there. There's just something special about that. But again, if you're using an electronic version, everybody's different, and that's that's okay. But we're casual with how diligently we pursue our relationship with Jesus Christ. No real urgency. 
That's how I think the, the disciples were. They're like, hey, we got Jesus for a long time. And so if he teaches us something and we don't really get it, he'll teach us again. Some of you have gone through training at your work, right? And you're like, ah, they said I have three weeks of training. So if I have three weeks of training, chances are pretty good what I learned on the first day probably isn't something that, that won't get repeated. So I'll, I'll kind of get it. It'll be there somewhere. Maybe I'll even jot it down. But it's not like I'm going to like hone in and say, I really need to know this. In fact, usually you don't really dive in until what? You get to a point where you're like, oh, I really need that for this job. I really need to know how to do that. Um, okay, so what was that process again? And then the second time you're like, okay, I get it. And it feels like that's kind of what happened with the disciples. Jesus ascended and you find them gathering there in, in an upper room and they're praying together and I think they're probably saying to one another, now do you remember when he said this? Yeah, I do, I do. I, I, wonder, I wonder what he really meant by that. Well, you know, he's already ascended to heaven, so we've got to really, we've got to figure this out. And it seems as if Peter understood being a servant at this point. Now, this isn't very long. This isn't written very long before Peter is going to be killed. But we see that he has this Christ-likeness when he says and introduces himself, Simon Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. Some people, you're in your 20s right now, and you're, you're looking around, and you say, there's people in their 70s. There's people in their 80s. I have all kinds of time to grow to be like Christ. Some of you as teenagers, you're like, I don't really need to be serious about my walk with Christ right now. Like, let me just live it up as a teenager. Let me go to college and have my fun. Let me do all of this, and then I'll become serious about pursuing Jesus Christ. Some of you in here, that's maybe your testimony, and this isn't to make... To look back and say, oh man, I was such a... No, but I think if you could advise someone else, you would say, why wait till your 30s? Why wait till your 40s to pursue Jesus? I was talking to fifth graders this week uh, at Impact Club. And I was saying to them, listen, it is impossible to live the best life without Jesus. It's impossible because Jesus is the one who came to give us abundant life. And if he came to give us abundant life, the, the life that's lived to the max, the life that's lived to the fullest, then you can't get it without Jesus. And so every day you need Jesus. Peter had come to understand the heart of Jesus and says as his first introduction, Simon Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. Now take note of the second part. Don't miss that either. Because being a servant of Jesus doesn't mean you lose the special nature of your calling. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So he understood the heart of God. He understood the heart that Jesus had when he came to serve. But Jesus was still Jesus when he came to serve. And he still had his calling and his mission. He still knew the reason he was here. And Peter understood that he was called and sent out as an apostle of Jesus Christ to do his work. That's a special calling. We've said often that God has a plan for each one of us. And as you fulfill that plan, you do what? You serve. You have a calling. You serve within your calling. Peter was called to be an apostle and as he fulfilled that calling, he served those around him. If we want to live intentionally, we need to understand our calling and then serve others as we live out that calling. If you're called to be a nurse, live out that calling by serving others. And you pretty much have to anyway, right? It's hard to be a nurse without serving others. If you're called to be a teacher, you live out that calling by serving others. If you're called to be a coach, you live out that calling by serving others. If you're called to lead a company, you do it by serving. If you're called to work on an assembly line, you do it by serving. We serve one another within our calling. So every one of you this morning, as you think about living intentionally, I want you to ask yourself this question, what's my calling? And am I serving within that calling? Am I serving others as I'm living out the calling of God upon my life. Peter certainly lets us know that he did. So we have the author, we get this, the audience in the second part 
of verse number one. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. There's so much in this. We can, I think, summarize it by saying he's writing to Christians. But there's something in the language that Peter uses here to describe Christians. He talks about how precious this faith is. Sometimes if we're not careful, I think we can lose a sense of wonder about being a child of God. If you've been a Christian for a lengthy period of time, it's almost like you just Take it for granted. But Peter, when he writes to his fellow believers, to other Christians, he, he says, listen, look at this. We have been saved through the righteousness of our God, and we have received a faith that is precious. Some of you have things that you consider very valuable. Maybe it's not a monetary value, but it's something that's very special to your family. Maybe an heirloom. Maybe it is something that has been passed down from generation to generation. Something that you hold tightly to. And you would consider that very precious. Every once in a while you'll see someone post on Facebook or maybe on a, another aspect of social media that they have lost something of great value to them. And they are seeking the help of others in trying to locate this thing. When Peter begins his letter, he says, listen, we have received a faith that is precious. It is, it is something to be treasured. It is something to be held on to. And if anyone understood how precious this gift, this faith was, it would have been Peter. It would have been Peter who walked with Jesus. It would have been Peter who denied Jesus. But it would have been Peter who had Jesus come back to him and restore him. It would have been Peter who understood the depth of the love that Jesus has, not only for him, but for all mankind. And he's trying to say, like, listen, what we've been given, it is something to cherish. It is something to hold on to. It is something to consider very, very, very important and valuable. The creator of the universe left his throne in glory. He was born as a humble baby. He laid in a feed trough. He grew up as the son of a carpenter. He lived a sinless life. As an innocent man, he went to the cruel cross of Calvary and took your place and took my place. That's this precious faith that we have. He gives this offer of salvation to everyone who would believe in him. Because he rose again on the third day, triumphing over sin, death, hell, and the grave. It is a remarkable, a precious thing that he would then give his righteousness. His righteousness. This is also talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. He would give his righteousness to everyone who trusts in him. That's, that's remarkable. And I hope you never get over it. I hope you never get over it. I hope it makes a difference when you wake up. I hope it makes a difference when you're going through tough times. I hope it makes a difference on your best days and on your worst days. Now look down with me. Verse number two says grace and peace. Those two are often combined in the, in the epistles, in the letters that are written to, whether it be churches or to Christians at large. Grace and peace, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read about it in Ephesians chapter number two, that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. Not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, otherwise we could boast. And peace. We understand that he is the prince of peace. We understand that he came to bring peace between God and man. Eternal peace, lasting peace. What this world needs and oftentimes longs for is just a little bit of peace. But he came to give lasting peace. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The more you get to know our great God and our great Savior, 
the more you will begin to grasp the depths of His grace and the more peace you will begin to have in your life. This word for knowledge here in verse number 2, there are, he uses knowledge, I think, seven times in the book of 2 Peter. When he uses it, he uses two different Greek words. One of them is epignosis, and the other one is just gnosis. Epignosis, which is what he uses right here, means a full knowledge, like coming to a full knowledge of Jesus Christ, understanding more fully who He is. Now, none of us start there, and honestly, until we reach eternity, we won't fully get there. But He is saying this, listen, grace and peace is going to be yours in abundance as you know Him more fully, as you get to know God, as, as you begin to understand, and I know this is the case for me, in my early years, and I would say, I'm talking probably 10, 15 years into my walk with the Lord, I still had a hard time trusting Him and really being all in with Him through things I didn't understand. Like, if I didn't understand why something bad was happening, early in my Christian walk, that would, that I struggled. I struggled. Like, God, what are you doing? Like, God, this doesn't make sense. God, I don't even like who you are right now. Like, those are things that came out of my mouth as a young Christian. I would imagine some of you have either experienced those thoughts or have verbally stated similar type things. The more I grow in my understanding of who God is, the more comfortable I have become with saying, you know what, God, I don't need to fully understand. I just trust who you are. Because I know I'd make a lousy God. I can't figure out some of the most basic things in my life. So I'm just going to trust you even when I don't understand. When I can't see the what, when I can't understand the why, as I've grown in my walk and in my knowledge of Jesus Christ, then I have a greater peace because when I don't know the what and I don't know the why, I remind myself of the who. And that he's always been faithful. And he's always been good. Even when things aren't good, he is always good. So he says, listen, I want you to have grace and peace in abundance through the full knowledge of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. As you go down to verse number 3, we read this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our, and this is the same epignosis, through our full knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Now again, there is a lot of theology that can be unpacked here. And in the short amount of time, we don't, have time to maybe go into every depth of that knowledge, but God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He doesn't just say, now, you've arrived, you have it all, end of story. Uh, sometimes you purchase, I would imagine some of you have experienced this as well, you, you purchase something that needs constructed after it arrives. How many of you have ever purchased something that needed put together? Thankfully, it's not our cars, right? I mean, that would be a little bit challenging. Imagine, imagine ordering a, a vehicle off of Amazon, and it comes in this package with instructions on how to put it together. Now, some of you as mechanics, you're like, well, I can do that. But for the rest of us, we probably couldn't. Yesterday, uh, we had to exchange vehicles with our son. Uh, we had taken his vehicle to my father-in-law's. He was doing some welding on the frame, this, that, and the other. Uh, he brought the car back to us, then we met him. While we were meeting with him, we had a package delivered to our house. The wonderful thing about technology, I got a notification saying, hey, it's been dropped off. That package was full of um, boards and full of screws and full of shelves for a cabinet we needed for the kids' wing. So we come in last night. And we just leaned the box up against the wall, walked away and said, hey, there's your cabinet. No, that's not exactly how that went. Now, we had everything we needed for the cabinet. 
But that cabinet, there was still a process of putting it together. Just so you know, had the Steelers game on my phone while I was putting this thing together. So I didn't have to worry about missing that. If, you, if you're following football, you'll be very thankful that my Steelers pulled out a good win yesterday. Everybody can say amen. amen. I got like one amen. I got like one amen. But as we're back there and we're putting that together, we had everything we needed for the cabinet. But that didn't mean that it was complete. And we have been given everything we need for life and godliness. And we sometimes have this mistaken idea that, well, since I've placed my faith in Jesus, that's the end. No, that's where you get the righteousness of Christ. That's where you get everything you need for life and godliness. And then you have the remainder of your life for him to work that out through you and to help put you together. Now, it continues on down through there, and, and it says in verse number 5, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And this is part of the construction process. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And if you look at that list and you say, do I have goodness? Do I have perseverance do i have self-control do i have brotherly kindness do i have love now i don't think that what this is is like a specific list of okay well step number one you add this first and then after you've added that then you add this now i think what peter is doing here is he's saying your christian walk isn't complete until glory and so you don't ever get to say, well, I'm a good Christian now. I guess I'm just, I'm done. I'm, I mean, I, I was trying to be more patient, and now I am more patient. And so God's, hey, I'm good. I'm good. That's it. No, I think what he's trying to teach us here is this. He says you need to make every effort, put in every ounce of energy that you have to continue growing in your walk with the Lord. And if we're going to be intentional and live intentionally in 2024 and for every year here on out, we're going to have to make every effort and say, okay, God, what do you want to do in me now? Thanks so much, God, for changing my attitude. I used to have such a bad attitude and you have changed that around, God. What do you want to do next? God, I've learned not to hate my neighbor, and I thank you for that. What do you want me to do next? Oh, I already know what the answer to that is. Not only don't hate your neighbor, you know what I want you to do? I want you to, I want you to love your neighbor. Now, some of your neighbors are naturally lovely. Pastor Alex has a naturally lovely neighbor. You guys think I'm talking about myself. No, I'm talking about Lindsay. Talk about Lindsay that lives right behind him. What do you? Man, some of you, Pastor Alex and I live right beside each other, and some of them thought that I was talking about myself. It's not what I was saying at all. God wants to continually grow you in your faith. As you look at these things here, I would imagine that none of us have arrived in even these few things. So let's just look at them. Goodness. Goodness is like this virtue that we develop, that we, that we have as a result of walking closely with the Lord. We take the right course of action. We have moral excellence. I want you to think about that for a second, okay? Even if you feel like, you know what, I'm good to people. That's not just what it's talking about. This word for goodness is talking about having a moral excellence. That means that our thought life is pure. That means that how we treat others is right. That means that what God has said we should do, we are doing. The things he says that we shouldn't do, we aren't doing. We have moral excellence. We choose the virtuous course of action, not just the easiest route. Well, he says, add to your faith this goodness or this virtue. 
And then add to goodness knowledge. Now, this knowledge is just the gnosis. I said there was epignosis and then just gnosis. This one here has to do with knowledge through experience. And what it means is this. Walk with the Lord and you will begin to understand to a greater degree who he is. This is knowledge through experience. Then he says add to knowledge self-control. Now self-control is mastering your desires and your passions. Can any of us truly say that we have mastered our desires and our passions and they are now completely in alignment with him? I don't think any of us can say that, but he's saying make every effort to keep adding to your faith. He says then add to perseverance, godliness, godliness, and we can say along with this, that would be holiness, more and more like Christ. Says after that, he says, add to godliness, brotherly kindness. This is the Greek word philia. Now, I've talked about this before. The Greek word philia sounds like, to some degree, Philadelphia, which is supposedly the city of brotherly love. They don't exactly live up to their reputation or to their name, but called the city of brotherly love. This is a friendship type of love. We should grow to love even those who are different than us in a brothers and sisters friendship type of love. But then he says this, and this is the last one, and I'll wrap up with it. There's so much more. I'll have to come back and teach through this a little bit more next week because I even had to skip some of the great and precious promises uh, that are listed there earlier in this passage. But he says, add to brotherly kindness love. Now, if you've been a student of God's word, you'll probably know that the Greek word used here, instead of it being philia, it is, anybody know? Thank you. It is agape. It is agape. It is the self-sacrificing love that Christ shows for the church. It is the self-sacrificing love. It is the love that is talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. It is the love that only comes from God. That's the type of love we are to have. And do you remember the two greatest commandments? (laughs) To love God and to do what? Love others. Do we ever fully get there no i don't think we do until we reach glory but peter says he says i want you to make every effort so my challenge for you this morning as you consider living intentionally start with this list i can look around this room many of you have been here for a number of years and i can see how your faith has grown how you have allowed god to and i'll just use this phrase or this 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 terminology you've allowed him to attack certain areas of your life you're you've allowed him to cause offense in certain areas of your life you've allowed him to say you know what dave that's got to change and you've allowed him to change those things i've seen it happen but that doesn't mean that you get to stop that just means you're on to the next thing okay god what's the next thing you want to conform into your likeness What's the next thing you want to change in my life? And so we become people who are intentionally on this journey to more and more and more and more and more and more and more more say, God, what do you want to do? Okay, God, I want to let you do that. And then we die to self and we live to him. That's why Jesus says what? Take up your cross daily and follow me. Let's live intentionally as we are, are starting 2024 Let's say, okay, you know what? I understand my calling, and as I live out my calling, I serve others. And then I'm going to make every effort to let God always be working in my life. I'm going to pause for just a moment before I pray, and I want you to think about this. What's the thing that you need to let him work on you right now? What's the area? You say, okay, God, my anger. Oh, man, I get so angry so quick. All right, God, I'm going to make every effort to submit to you in that area. You know what, God? My language is so bad sometimes. I'm going to make every effort to submit to you in that area. And I want to make sure that you understand this. This is not about just trying hard to do it on your own. That's why every time that I say make every effort to submit to you in this area, 
I'm going to make every effort to allow you to work on me in this area. It's all about what he's going to do. You're going to make every effort to submit to him. Does that make sense? Because if you keep trying, you'll keep failing. Then you're going to get frustrated. And then you're going to give up. And then you're going to need somebody to stand before you in a year and say, you got to do it. Submit to him. So let's make every effort to submit to him. What's the area he wants to transform in your life? Father, thanks so much for your word. Thanks for the challenge to live intentionally. Thanks for this specific passage in 2 Peter. You have given us great and precious promises. And we'll look at some of those next week. But you've promised to never leave us, never forsake us. You've promised that if we come to you when we are weary and heavy laden, that you'll give us rest. You've promised, and this is a promise you already fulfilled. Uh, you, you promised that you would send your son, Jesus. You would promise to then, for those who trusted in him, that you would give us a new heart and a new spirit, and you have done that. You have fulfilled your promises and are still fulfilling them to us. So we are so thankful for them. I pray that for everyone here this morning that you, that the Holy Spirit would impress upon them one area that they need to make every effort to intentionally allow you to work in their life. And Lord, I pray that as collectively we allow you to teach us and to train us and to mold us more and more into your image that this community would realize there's something different about those folks and it wouldn't be because of the church that anyone goes to it would be because of the God that we submit to so God I pray that as we live intentionally for you in 2024 you would make an impact upon